Hello everyone. This will be our next video lecture for Wednesday, uh, April the 15th, and this will be an introduction into the next section in our book, The Romantic Era. Um, I hope that you are working on completing the written test that was assigned for Monday. It is due today by 1.30. Um, several of you have taken the test. Overall, the grades look really good. So uh, keep up good work. We'll move on to our next section here. So let's talk a little bit about the Romantic period. Now you'll find this in your chapter, uh, your, these chapters in your book. In my version of the book, it begins on, oh, let's see here, page 213, and it's known as the Romantic period. Now, the Romantic period basically runs from 1820 to around 1900. Now, that's the academic version. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you the Romantic period still goes on today. There are people today still composing music in the Romantic style. And it's the piece, it's the kind of music that's probably the most familiar to you. You'll hear examples in this in this uh, section that you'll go, hey, I know this piece of music, and we hear it all the time. So um, even though 1800, you know, 20, that's 200 years ago, we still have music that's being written in this style even today, and it's it's fantastic music. So let's talk a little bit about overall uh, what's going on in the Romantic period. So um, this term, romantic, um, it's it really has two essentially different meanings. Uh, the first, romantic music, is commonly referred to uh, it indicate any kind of music which supposedly expresses or encourages tender emotions of, of, of intimate attraction or personal attraction um, or just being in love, okay? That's, that's the, the, gen, the generic general term for romantic music, you know, you know candlelight and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in academic terms, romantic music refers to this time period from 1820 to 1900. So let's don't get those two confused. Um, we're basically referring to uh, a historical period in music history and when we refer to things as romantic music, just like the classical period and the broke period. This is the romantic period. So there is romantic music in the romantic period, uh, music that expresses love and attraction and all that. So um, don't, don't get tripped up on the those two words. It's kind of like the classical period and classical music. You know, they, they really mean two different two different things. Okay, so of course we had the classical period, which we just studied. That preceded the Romantic period, and it's this Romantic term. It's just like in the classical period, it's related to the literature of the day, the architecture of the day, the sculpture of the day, the painting of the day. So the philosophy, all the visual arts, all of that goes together in this period of time when we refer to uh, the Romantic period. It's not referring just to music, but to all these things that are going on during this time. Um, okay, now, there's a great deal of things that are happening in Europe at this time, in Western music. First of all, you have very defined countries now. You have a very strong England. You have a defined France. You have a defined Germany. You have a defined Russia. You have a defined Austria, Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire still in play. You have the beginnings of a defined country in Italy. You have a defined country in Spain. So what happens is you have an increase in something called nationalism, where people are proud to be English. They are proud to be Russian. They are proud to be German. So I think the term nationalism has kind of gotten a bad rap here the last few uh, years, or the media has turned national in, nationalism into something similar to racism, and nothing could be farther than the truth. It just means you're proud of the country that you belong to. Um, it's okay to, to have pride in your country. 
and and be happy that you're uh, you know from Germany or you're from France or you're from Russia you know I'm proud that I'm from the United States you know I have no problem with that okay and it's not that I'm being racist to anybody else or anything it's just that the word has kind of been misinterpreted uh, to and turned it into some sort of uh, weapon or some sort of slander so but you have an increase in nationalism and the composers in the romantic period they start writing music that reflects their country they in, they write the indigenous music from their country in their composition so we'll talk more about that later okay the industrial revolution has occurred and it has created great wealth and very defined social classes in Europe so you have a still have that aristocratic wealthy uh, class, the royal, I'm sorry, aristocratic royal class, you know, with the titles and all that stuff, although those titles are meaning less and less and less every year. You have a wealthy class of people that have become wealthy through business. You have a working middle class, people that make a substantial income, uh, a steady income every week, and then you have the poor class, and these are the people that are generally the least educated and least well trained. So we have some very definite social classes you know, during the Romantic period, and it's basically because of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, now, some big things that happen musically in the Romantic period. We have an expanded orchestra. You know, we have orchestras now that are much bigger than what we had in the classical period. Again, wealth has driven those sizes. And sizes of the orchestra in the Romantic period are very similar to what they are today. <clears throat> We have instruments now that allow us to have fantastic ranges of, of in the dynamics of the music, how loud or how soft something is, how high and how low. The instruments have now progressed to the point that they're capable of giving the performers and the composers a great deal of flexibility as far as what they can write for. Um, which leads us to being able to write music that has a lot more emotion, a lot more expression. Um, the tempos of the music, how the speed, slow and fast. We're playing music much faster. We're playing music much slower. And in the pieces, they come and go. They change tempos drastically within a piece of music. Um, there's much more flexibility in the musical forms that the composers are writing. Um, they're, they're, they're just not so rigid. In the Baroque period, it had to be in a certain form. Uh, classical period still really kind of pigeonholed into certain, you know, uh, lengths uh, how music had to be written. We kind of throw all of those rules out the window in the Romantic period. We actually, in, in, we actually uh, invent some new musical forms uh, in the Romantic period, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about what those are. So um, um, I referred to nationalism just meant we're composing music about our social classes, the working men. You know, uh, we're composing music about the working class and it's working class music. We're composing music about the aristocratic class and it's aristocratic music. Um, we're composing music that represents the country that we live in. And I think the most important thing is we have an even increased interest in mythology and the supernatural and powers that are beyond our comprehension and events. So uh, composers are using this to uh, motivate them to write music. They're using it as subject matter for the things they're writing. Okay. Now, those are describe those are characteristics of the music. Well, let's talk a little second about the historical things that are going on because this is what drives those events happening in music. Now, we've already talked about the word nationalism. Another political or social event uh, that began to rise in liberalism, um, being very liberal-minded, very open-minded about uh, things going on in your society. Um, very open to change. Uh, radicalism, some very extreme political views of how things were to be run. Um, racism, with the development of the social classes, 
uh, there was a great deal of racism that became. Um, we became very, with this rise of nationalism, people became very identifiable as to what nationality they were. Well, one nationality thought they were better than another. This also had to do with religion. So if you were Jewish, some, uh, some Christians didn't care for Jews, vice versa, or uh, people who were atheists who didn't believe in any religion at all. To look at. So you, you had this form of, of racial identity uh, in religion and politics and nationality. That's a real problem, and we still fight that today. Uh, racism is still a big issue even in today's society. Um, Later in the Romantic period, the late Romantic period, in the late 1800s, you had something uh, that was referred to as conservatism, very conservative uh, uh, ideas. And we uh, sometimes this is called uh, Victorianism uh, after uh, the standards set by Queen Victoria in the uh, British Empire in the uh, late 1800s. And, you know, very, very restrained dress, very restrained hairstyles. Um, you know, think about those very early bathing suits where every square inch of your body had to be covered. We didn't want to show any skin. You know, collars on our shirts were way high. You know, ladies wore big full uh, dresses. So, you know, their body type and size was kind of hidden. You know, couldn't tell whether they thin or, or, or fat or curvy or skinny. You know, all of that was kind of hidden up. So, the, all these political and social events, uh, they're driving the music. Um, lots of ongoing wars. Uh, these countries now, they start expanding and they, they fight each other all the time. So, lots and lots of wars going on. Um, the middle class continues to grow and becomes more powerful every decade. Um, and eventually, they're much more powerful even than the aristocratic class because they're so much bigger. Um, with this growing wealth, education continues to expand. Even the poorest of the, of the social classes is capable of getting a very good education. And um, music is still a big part of this education. It's considered a, uh, a very important part of the daily curriculum. Um, there becomes a new awareness of aesthetic experiences, um, apprehension. Horror, terror, awe, wonderment, uh, all of these things become involved in the music and the composers want to create these emotional experiences based on these, you know, these, these uh, experiences that uh, you have yourself in your personality. And then this interest in the supernatural and um, mythology becomes very, very, very important. Okay. So... And then we have the social music characteristics. Finally, after all these decades, we have a social acceptance of musicians as respected members of the community. It's okay to be a musician. Uh, you're not viewed as some kind of servant, some kind of second-class citizen. Um, most musicians uh, now are freelancers. They work for a salary. Um, they move from job to job. They're not bound to the church. They're not bound to an aristocratic family that's going to support them, although there are still some folks that do that. Um, most folks are copywriters, and they're in charge of their own destiny and how they make a living. Um, there is some copyright protection and printing royalty. So uh, a composer's uh, creations are protected by copyright laws where people can't copy it and steal it. And then they receive payment when their music is printed and sold for other people to play. That's very good. Um, there, we've had this continued growth of musical ensemble sizes. So the orchestra finally reaches the standard size that we have now. And our instruments have gotten better and better. And they're much like the instruments we have today. And this Western music that we have begins to have a worldwide influence. We see our Western music begin to go all over the world. It makes its way into the Far East. It makes its way into the New World. And, of course, it begins 
a, a trend to have music developed there that follows in the footsteps of what's been going on in the Western music. Um, so our composers, they're, they're just exploring all kinds of new limits and tone colors and dynamics and tempos and ranges and emotions. And that's why it's romantic music. It's just all about emotion and expression. Um, literature becomes very important to music. It's linked together. We write music that's based on literature pieces. Um, we have several different musical forms that are new that are developed during this period of time, and older ones are expanded to make them even more uh, wide-ranging. Um, I think one of the most important things is we have something called program music, which program music is very descriptive. It's describing something like this is an event or a, a happening that we're describing. Um, program music is very important. Um, Music tends, some of it tends to be very patriotic and very nationalistic. It represents our country. Um, and then just the, the works just become more and more complex and they're much longer. So back in the Baroque period, you know, Bach wrote almost 3,000 pieces. Vivaldi wrote over 1,000. Uh, those pieces weren't as long as these are. So now a composer, he might write 100 or 120. Uh, but these pieces are much, much, much longer. Okay, well that's overall uh, the just an overview of what's going on in the Romantic period. Now I have one composer I want to talk with you today about, and he's actually not in the book, um, but I think his music is very important. I want to talk a little bit about this, and I'll include his name and everything in my study guide. I haven't put this up yet, but because I'm I'm still revamping it for online instruction. And I want to check some. Um, I want to check some um, hypertext links for video links and to make sure they're all still there. But let's talk a second about a guy, an Italian composer. His name is Giacchino Rossini. R R O S S I N I Rossini, and he was born in 1792 and he lived to 1868. He was Italian, and he is known as a composer of opera. Now, here's that word again, so many of you cringe about, but opera has become extremely popular in uh, the Romantic period. Again, the social classes, even the poor people can go and watch opera. It's a big part of their entertainment, and uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of operas uh, written and performed every year during this period of time. So, large amount of money to be made, so it was very lucrative for composers to write operas because they could be performed over and over and over again, sell tickets, and, and make a lot of money. But Rossini basically is only known for writing operas. He did write some sacred music, and he did write some chamber music, but those pieces are largely forgotten. But he wrote 39 operas, and he began writing uh, operas at a very early age. Uh, he was in his late teens when he wrote his first one. And his operas were so successful that by the time he, uh, by the time uh, 1829 rolls around, and he was only 37, 38 years old, he basically retired. Um, his operas had been so successful, uh, he just didn't feel the need to work anymore. And he was married, and he, he basically retired and became a devoted family man and spent time with his kids. Um, he didn't really write a lot of music after this retirement. He was just a couple of small things, but for the most part, uh, he was a retired guy and lived in seclusion, um, lived off the wealth that he had manufactured in uh, from the, the popularity of his overtures. Well, there are, a couple, there are a couple of very, very famous operas that you will know the music from. Now, on Friday, I'll talk about another one. Uh, by Rossini, and I just don't want this lesson to be too terribly long. And uh, that's an opera called The Barber of Seville. We'll come back to that um, because it has from the same story that uh, that Mozart wrote his opera called The Marriage of Figaro. That character Figaro, remember the barber? He's in this one too. It's the same piece of literature driving it. We'll talk about that on Friday. But today I want to talk to you about a the last opera that Rossini wrote. And this is an opera based on the folk tale of William Tell, who was a patriot. He was rising up 
against a oppressive leadership. Uh, he's the one that was a fantastic archer, supposedly shot the apple off of his son's head um, in one of the in one of the uh, scenes from the opera. But um, the opera itself is fairly well known, and it's performed a fair bit. But one of the new musical forms that was written and, and invented for Romantic period was something called an overture. And opera writers, uh, composers of opera, had trouble getting the audience to come in and find a seat. Um, and let's get the show started. So they wrote pieces of music that really didn't have a lot to do with the opera, but they tended to be very dynamic, exciting pieces of music. And they were designed to say, reach out to the audience said, hey, it's time to shut up, come, sit down, get in the seat. The show's about to start. And many of these overtures have become much more popular than the opera ever was. So I have uh, several examples I'm going to put uh, in this link uh, that I want you to go and check out. The overall opera is... Oh gosh, it's about 16, I'm sorry, the overall overture is about 16 minutes long. And it has three very distinct parts. There's an opening section, and I'm going to give you a link of an orchestra playing the original version of this. And the, of course, the very beginning in the link starts, uh, there's some talking uh, introduction in this piece. The actual beginning starts at 2.40. Uh, then the second part starts at 8.40. Uh, in the in the uh, video, and then the final part starts at 11:15. I really think you'll find out you have heard this entire overture, but you very hear, rarely hear it all the way through. But these three parts have been used many, many times. Uh, we hear them in commercials, we see them in movies, we see them in TV shows, um, we hear them on radio. So. Uh, I, this piece I think you will recognize. And it's the third part that's the most recognizable for you. So follow the links. Um, I've tried to make it fun for you. Uh, we get to watch some cartoons, and uh, I think you'll like this lot. So check out the video links, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Rossini on Friday and then move on to our next uh, um, person that actually is in the book, and that's Franz Schubert. So I'd like you in the book to read page 213 and this whole introduction section on Romanticism. So Romanticism in Music and Characteristics of Romantic Music, that's 219, 220, 221. And that keeps going um, up through the Romantic Composers and their public. And go up to the section called the Art Song. And that's about 10 pages to read. There's a lot of pictures and stuff there. So do that for Friday, and then we'll carry on with our next people. Uh, finishing up Rossini and also um, introducing Franz Schubert on Friday. So, again, I hope this uh, video finds you well, uh, safe, uh, and um, keep working on the, uh, the test. Get it done. And um, you're, you're doing a good job. And uh, just hang in there. If you have any kind of questions, you know, give me, shoot me an email, and I'll try my best to answer them for it. So, everybody, take care. I'll see you again on video on Friday.